Hi and welcome to a video on the definite integral for a Calc 1 course. So let's talk about that Riemann sum. You should have just completed some homework or some practice on finding areas using rectangles and we put in a finite number of rectangles under a curve and that helped us to get a good estimate for the area under the curve. And so we used, for example, in one of our problems, I'll give you a sketch here, something like square root of x, and we went from 0 to 4, and we put in four rectangles, and we used either right endpoint, left endpoint, or midpoint, actually, to find the area, and that was a pretty good estimate. So let's think about calculus for a minute because hopefully just finding some areas of some rectangles didn't resonate to be too difficult and it probably didn't um, speak calculus to you. So calculus so far has been talking about the study of limits. So how does that apply to these rectangles? Well, we should know that if we're putting in four rectangles, Right? That's a finite number of rectangles here, and that's just going to give me a pretty generic estimation or approximation for that area. So if we think about how can I be more precise or more accurate, we would want to put in more rectangles. So I don't necessarily need to expand the area. What if I'm still just needing this area under this curve from 0 to 4? Well, if I want a better estimate than the one we got in the previous section, I might want to put in more than four rectangles because that's going to give me more data points and I'm not going to have such a big overestimate or underestimate when I'm using my left and my right endpoints. So how many rectangles do we want to put in? More, 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 right? A thousand, nope, a million, nope, an infinite amount of rectangles. So when we put in an infinite amount of rectangles, now we're talking about a limit. And we said the number of rectangles was n, right? So I want n to approach infinity. Now let's think about one of these um, sort of consequences if n is approaching infinity. So if I'm going from 0 to 4 in this very, very finite enclosed space here, and I'm going to put in an infinite amount of rectangles in there, how wide are each one of those rectangles? Well, as n is approaching infinity at the same time then, my delta x or my width of each rectangle will be approaching zero. And that's basically what this Riemann sum is saying, is that if you sum up all the height times the width and you sum that up, right, this is my idea of a Riemann sum. And we get to the idea that if we can put that the delta x is going to approach zero in front of this sum, then that is what we call this definite integral. And so this right here is a really big link um, to what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the chapter and for really the remainder of your Calc 1 course here. So that definite integral right there will give you the area. That is an antiderivative symbol. We've briefly seen it um, prior to this, just in doing power rule stuff. Um, and so we're going to put that into play to represent area in this section. And one thing is that area is positional. So if you have an area that is under the x-axis, it is in fact going to be represented by a negative area. Okay, so if I have part of my curve like so and part of my curve like so and I'm finding the total area here, right, that area in there is going to be negative and this area up here is going to be positive based on position. All right, so 
the graph of a function f is given. Estimate, this says, the area under f of x with respect to x. That means that these bounds are also x from x equals 0 to x equals 10. That's what that antiderivative or integral, this definite integral is saying to you. Estimate the area under your function from x equals 0 to x equals 10. And now it's going to tell me how to do that. They want five subintervals. Subintervals is just a fancy way for saying rectangles. And we're going to do the same thing we kind of did in the previous section here. We're going to use right endpoints, left endpoints, and midpoints. So let me first just count some here. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this does end at ten. Five, so five is right here. Okay. So if we are using five rectangles, let's figure out the width of each rectangle. Well, I'm going from zero to ten based on my definite integral right here, start to finish, zero to ten. So ten minus zero all over how many of them you want to put in because remember delta x is b minus a over n. So I'm going from 0 to 10 so b minus a would be 10 minus 0 all over 5 because I'm putting in 5 rectangles. We can hopefully pretty easily see that they all need to be too wide. So we can start with right endpoints. So some people note this R5 for example because what that's telling them is they're finding the area, but they're finding it using right endpoints, R for right, with five approximating subintervals or rectangles. So some people will denote it that way. Some people will say A of R. Some people will say A of five. I, there's no right or wrong you know, notation here. It's whatever you're going to understand when you look back at it. All right, so right endpoints with five subintervals, they're all too wide. I'm never going to be changing that for this problem, so I'll just factor that out now. If I draw the first rectangle and it has a base of two from zero to two, I'm using the right endpoint to determine its height. So if you now follow or find the right endpoint there, where does that right edge take you to your curve? You're actually down here at negative one. So my first height, if you will, is negative one. And I'm going to darken this x-axis. That's always something I like to do because I have a hard time sometimes seeing the x and y-axis on their grids. All right, so now if I draw the next rectangle, it's going to go from two to four, right, two wide. And I'm going to use the right endpoint to determine height. Well, the right endpoint is on that x-axis, so it is zero high. Okay, then my next rectangle is going to go from four to six. Find the right endpoint, or where is your curve along that right vertical line, if you will, at x equals 6, your curve is down here at negative 2. Keep going. So from now we're looking 6 to 8. So I'll draw the next one from 6 to 8. I don't know why it drew a rectangle or a triangle in there. So from 6 to 8, sorry, Draw the right edge up. That's up here at 2. And my very last one is from 8 to 10. And it's, the right edge is way up here at the peak. So that is 4. 
So if I add this correctly, it's 2 times 3, or 6. Right, 6, 4, 3, yep. All right, so now let's look at what would the left endpoints be. So, okay, left with five approximating rectangles, they are all still too wide. Okay, all of them. And so now when I look, I already kind of have some of these bases drawn. So if that's too difficult for you to figure out, um, you can, you know, erase those if you want and start over, or you can do them in a different color, whatever makes it easy for you to see. I'll erase them just for us now to eliminate confusion. I darken my axes. All right, and start fresh. So left endpoint. So if I look from zero to two, I'm going to use the left edge to determine that height. So it's all the way up here at three. And then from two to four, I'm going to use the left edge. So I'm down here at negative one. That's my rectangle. And then from four to six, if you draw your rectangle, your left edge is on the x-axis or left endpoint where your curve meets um, x equals four is at zero. And then the next rectangles, left edge is down here at negative two. So there would be that rectangle. And my very last and final rectangle would be from eight to 10. Left endpoint is up here at 2. So this would be 2 minus 2, 0 plus 2. So 2 times 2, so 4. All right, so let's now look at midpoints. And again, I'm going to clear this because I can. Um, I think it's just easier for instruction to start with a clear graph each time. All right. So again, I'm going to say M5 because that's denoting for me that I'm using the midpoint technique with five approximating subintervals or five rectangles. And so they're all too wide. And the first one going zero to two, the midpoint is right on that x-axis at x equals one. That's where it meets my curve. So that height of that first rectangle would be zero. Second rectangle going from two to four, you're gonna follow the midpoint. So at x equals three, wherever your curve is at, at x equals three, which is down here at negative one. That's the height, if you will, of that rectangle. And then the next rectangle, the height is as well, negative one. And then I'm going from now six to eight. That's right at zero. So that height would be zero. And then the last one here, I'm going from eight to 10. And the midpoint is up here. I'll count it in a second. So it's one, two, three. Oops. So it'd be two times negative two, one, or two. Okay, so what might be confusing to you is that in the functions that you've seen in the past, many of them have been always increasing or always decreasing. So if that's the case and you have always increasing, for example, we know that if we're always increasing, our left is going to be lower than our right. And so our lower estimate's always going to come from that left edge and our upper estimate will come from the right edge or the right endpoints. And then our midpoint is usually in between. What happened in this one is we have a function that is increasing and decreasing, so changing um, throughout and we have some negative areas as well. So depending on which, which um, method you're using, you may not incorporate all of that negative area in there or maybe you have too much positive area or not enough, et cetera. 
Um, so you will see times when your midpoint is not in between your left and your right. Again, that's just explained by your function probably having multiple curves throughout and changing from increasing to decreasing, having those turning points, etc. All right, so let's look at another one. Um, let me get to it here. And I'm going to give you a table of values in this case. So in the last one, you know, it gave you sort of a graph of a function without its algebraic um, identity. And here is the same thing. I'm not giving you necessarily what f of x is as a function, just talking about f. So a table of values of an increasing function, f is shown. So remember, I just talked about this. If a function is increasing and you take a look at one rectangle, for example, the left edge is always going to be lower than that right edge. So your left is going to be your lower or underestimate. So use the table to find the lower and upper, upper estimates for, and again, all they're really asking you to do is to read this, identify what it means, and then be able to find it. So you're, we're asking you to find the area under f of x from, since it's dx, it's x equals 10 to x equals 30. Again, here's my lower bound and here's my upper bound. Okay. All right. So in my table, it should make sense to you that I'm given from 10 to 30. Sometimes you're given extra information. You certainly wouldn't want to count that. So if you were given one additional piece of information, like 34, let's say you're at um, 10, I'm making it up, you would not want to do that or use it because you're only asked to find the area from 10 to 30. So it wouldn't even come into play anyway. So they don't tell me how many approximating rectangles or subintervals to put in. That's for me to find out. Again, we want to use as many of these as we can. We're not asked to find midpoint. We're asked to find lower and upper estimates. So we want to be able to use all of these. So what I can do is just assume that if my first rectangle is going from 10 to 14, is there a constant delta x of 4 throughout my table? There is. I add 4, add 4, add 4, and add 4, and add 4 to get to all those next x values. So I can say delta x will be 4. So again, if you wanted to find out how many you're putting in, you can use the formula. Some of you will never use the formula because you'll probably just think about it Logically, that if you're going 20 units, right, from 10 to 30, and you want delta x to be 4, you're going to need 5 rectangles. But here's the proof of that. 30 minus 10 all over n, and you know that that part has to be 20 over n equals 4, because delta x was 4. So n is five. I'm going to put in five approximating rectangles. So I can also say lower a five or area with five or left with five, right? And then label them lower and upper when I'm done, even though I sort of already know which is which. All right, so left with five, they're all four wide and Here's the first one, second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one. We've done this before. So negative 12 plus negative 6 plus negative 2 plus 1 plus 3 will be the heights of all of my rectangles. And so I can add all of these up, and it should come out to 4 times negative 16, if I just added that correctly. So negative 64. The right endpoints with five approximating rectangles. They're all four wide. And I'm going to start here. First, second, third, fourth, 
fifth. In other words, if I draw the first rectangle from 10 to 14, the right edge, right, or the right end point at negative 6 would be the height. So negative 6 plus negative 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 8. So this would be 4 times positive 4 or 16. And you can see what a big difference this is, right? So, okay, again, oftentimes left endpoints and right endpoints are very different, especially if your function increases quickly or decreases quickly. They will be very different. Now, I think it should also be obvious to you that this is my lower estimate or underestimate, and this is my upper estimate, which again is exactly what we thought based on the problem at hand. And I also did not have a label, um, so I don't have to worry about necessarily labeling these as it shows. The only difference between this and the ones that you did in section 5.1 is really the notation, understanding that idea of what does that integral show you and how did that area come about. Um, there is a really good, as of right now, it's online. Um, I can't promise that it'll be there in a week. Um, but if you have a TI connectivity cable, um, you could certainly go to download this program. I also have the website listed here. This is from the University of Arizona. Somebody wrote this program and I can show you what it does here in a second, but you can also go through if you don't have the cable and you can type in these things on your calculators. So for example, I can go to, here we go. I'll move it over here so you can see it. So I can go to program and I can say new and I can call it whatever I want. You'll notice that the alpha is blinking. So anytime the alpha lock is on, all your blue, um, excuse me, alpha is green. <laughs> all of your green will be um, displayed. So all of your letters that you'll see above all your numbers will display. So I can just call this rectangles, for example. You're not going to have enough letters to say all of it. So I'll just leave out an A, for example, and just say N, G, L. Where's L? There we go. And then I'm going to put an extra return um, because sometimes you actually or accidentally get into this program and you have a moment of panic and you hit clear because you don't mean to be editing it. So if your first line of code is in this first line, then you've just deleted the first line of code and your, pro your program's never going to work again. So I tend to just for safety or security so you don't have to keep reprogramming this, I just put an extra line in there that's empty. So if you do ever get into it and accidentally hit clear or delete or something, it's not going to screw up that first line. So you can follow what this says. I'm not going to go through all of it, but for example, it says prompt is in program under input output or IO. So go to program, go to IO, and you'll see prompt right there. It says prompt, right? I'm following along with what this says. Then it says alpha A, comma, your comma is above the 7, alpha B, comma, alpha N, comma, alpha t and then hit enter and go to the next line and again it tells you where everything is so and it even tells you yes this is a zero and this is a one etc but let me take a minute here and show you what this can do for you all right so if you are typing this in on your calculator a couple quick things that you might not be able to find um, the quotations are alpha and plus okay the store button is this store right above on right here. So anytime you see them use the arrow, um, I think it's on the previous page here. So anytime they use the arrow and they talk about store, right, that's what this is right here. Um, and then otherwise I think everything else is fairly self-explanatory. 
And then there is a check. So once you have this program, if you choose to, again, this is optional, once you have this program downloaded into your calculator, they give you a, how to run the program. It's sort of a test to yourself. So what we're going to try to do is try to find the area under that curve, and we're going to use six rectangles. And first, we're going to use right endpoints. And the way this is written is T is whether you're using left, mid, or right. And so the T value for left will always be a zero, for midpoint will always be a half, and for the right will always be a one. These are just always scenarios. So if that's the case, then when I go to run my my formula here, you're going to go to y equals, you're going to type in the curve that you want to find the area under. Again, this is just good for um, these summation rectangles or approximating rectangles. So we'll put that in. I put in the window that they recommended because we're going to find the area from 1 to 4. Right, so we're really approximating x squared plus 3, or f of x, with respect to x from 1 to 4, and we're going to use 6 rectangles to do that. Okay, so I go here, I'm going to go back to my home screen now, because I've done the window that they recommended, and I'm going to run my program. So I select program, it's the only one in here, execute is what it defaults to, Hit enter to actually run it. It asks you for these things. So from A to B, so from one, enter, to four, enter. And is the number of rectangles, which we said was six. And this is where you're going to identify left, mid, or right. So because we want right approximating rectangles, T is one. This is always, again, just zero for left, half for mid, or one for right. Hit enter. And the reason I like this one so much is there's a few of these programs out there. I really like the way this one is written because I think it forces you to pause and really reflect on what you have and if it makes sense. So it has paused it right now. So don't wait too long. <laughs> Hit enter to unpause it. And you're going to get to see one, two, three, four, five, six rectangles. And you can hopefully see that these are the right end point or right approximating rectangles here and there's six of them so I get the visual first it paused it for me and now hit enter and it says your sum of all those rectangles is 33.875 um, so again this was courtesy of Arizona uh, University of Arizona and so that um, website is down there for you if you would like to download that. If not, it certainly is something that we can do these calculations with by hand. That's what this section was about, and you'll be expected to set it up and do this by hand for any quizzes and tests that you have coming your way, I'm sure. Um, hope you learned about the definite integral so far in areas. Thanks for watching.